This is the story of how one man rose from Goldman Sachs banker to climate change apocalypse experiment mastermind to World of Warcraft gold magnate to far right-wing propagandist to shadow president. Born in Virginia to patriotic blue-collar Democrats in 1953, Bannon's first political experience was running for student body president at Virginia Tech in 1975. The outgoing president, Gary Clisham, denounced him. It has in the past been somewhat of a precedent for the incumbent president not to endorse a successor. In this presidential race, some candidates have resorted to such low tactic of misinforming and misrepresenting the student body. I must intervene. Bannon went on to win the election. Bannon joined the Navy, telling a fellow officer it would look good on his resume because he wanted to go into politics someday. Little record of his time in the Navy exists because of undisclosed issues with the service's personnel archives. But he was stationed in the Arabian Sea, the Persian Gulf, and at the Pentagon. He left the Navy for Harvard Business School. Then, like much of future President Trump's staff, Bannon went to work for Goldman Sachs. I'm in business with Goldman Sachs. I do things with them. The firm is certainly not the, uh, the firm it used to be, uh, although it's still one of the, you know, the building blocks of our capitalist uh, society. He was with the investment bank only briefly before splintering off his own firm, Bannon & Co., which focused on the media, where Bannon would amass his fortune and also his penchant for propaganda. Bannon executive produced films like the Sean Penn directed The Indian Runner. It cost $7 million to make and made $191,125. That is bad. Never trust a bear. An executive who worked with Bannon said he was constantly telling stories about great warriors of the past like Attila the Hun. Victory at all costs is a dangerous way to look at the world. As part of his payment for brokering a deal between two companies, Bannon got partial ownership of five TV shows. One was Seinfeld. A portion of the profits of Seinfeld and its syndication go to Steve Bannon. And who is responsible for making hate mongering and fascism popular again? You are. <laughs> Bannon was also director of Biosphere 2, which is not a movie. It was an experiment where humans lived for years inside a giant terrarium in the desert. It did later make it to film as a Pauly Shore movie. It's been referred to in the past as a planet in a bottle. Hmm. Bannon wanted to research the consequences of massive climate change on Earth as if it were an inevitability. He orchestrated a huge change in the path of the experiment, which caused chaos among the scientists. He was pushed out of the project, but then, against scientists' wishes, was brought back as CEO. He brought federal marshals with him to enforce a court order, turning the whole place over to him. His takeover failed, and Bannon resigned, but not before threatening to ram a scientist's safety report down her redacted throat. He did not shove anything down that scientist's throat, but in 1996, he was arrested for domestic violence. Bannon denies these allegations, and they were withdrawn. Mr. Bannon grabbed his ex-wife's neck, also pulling her into the car. She started to fight back, striking at his face so he would let go of her. She was able to get away from him. She ran into the house with him following her. She was dialing 911 when she got to the twins. Mr. Bannon jumped over her and the twins to grab the phone from her. Once he got the phone, he threw it across the room. The couple separated a year later. Bannon moved into the spare room of his first ex-wife. Bannon sold his investment firm and made enough money to produce Titus, an adaptation of Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus. It was a critical success, but a total commercial failure. Yet still, around this time, Bannon realized the power of the media. It's not only not going to get better, it's going to get worse every day. It's 2004. Steve Bannon puts out his first documentary. In the traditional motion picture story, the villains are usually defeated. The ending is a happy one. I can make no such promise for the picture you're about to watch. In the face of evil, Reagan's war in word and deed did not see wide release, but Bannon had his eyes on Hollywood. He had discovered the power of the media in controlling people, 
and he was learning in turn to control it. He met with powerful Christians in Hollywood and Washington to discuss a propaganda strategy. He worked on an unreleased film called The Singularity, Resistance is Futile. It tells the story of a world ravaged by scientific hubris going against the will of God. It calls abortion the American eugenics movement. He wanted it to star Mel Gibson. It was never made. I'm ashamed of that. Neither was Bannon's rap musical adaptation of Shakespeare's Coriolanus. Word. Another unproduced classic, Destroying the Great Satan, The Rise of Islamic Fascism in America. It opens on a shot of an Islamic flag flying over the White House. The apocalyptic theme runs throughout Bannon's canon. Bannon would later reveal that he believes we are heading toward the end of the world. They have a Twitter account up today, ISIS does, about turning the United States into a river of blood. But for every unproduced film, there are a few produced ones that made it to the straight-to-DVD circuit, all denouncing the evils of liberalism, non-Christianity, the establishment, and Bannon's former employer, Big Banks. They have interviews with luminaries like Newt Gingrich and Phil Robertson from Duck Dynasty. One blames Woodstock attendees for the 2008 financial industry bailout. One, entitled Undefeated, is the story of former Alaska governor and defeated vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin. You can't blink, so I didn't blink then even. He premiered one film, Generation Zero, at a Tea Party convention, where he was booed by the audience for his ties to Wall Street. Unlike the manufactured crises of global warming and healthcare, this is a true crisis. And then there's the fantasy gold business. Bannon worked with a company that used Chinese labor to earn gold in World of Warcraft. He paid laborers to play the game, then sold that virtual gold for real money. He convinced former employer Goldman Sachs to invest $60 million in the venture. They were eventually sued for ruining World of Warcraft. But Bannon would prevail. In 2010, Bannon let a friend move his company into some office space he owned. That friend was Andrew Breitbart. I'm looking for you, you Occupy freaks with your glitter bombs. Bring it on! Founder of Breitbart.com a far-right news outlet that includes sections such as black crime. When Andrew Breitbart died suddenly in 2012, Bannon would take over his site. Under Bannon, the site grew further right-wing and supported Ted Cruz. Um. That may have been because some of Cruz's biggest backers, Robert Mercer and his daughter Rebecca, invested millions into the site. But something happened. He's a very successful entrepreneur. The Mercers will come back later. In 2014, a New York real estate magnate and WWE Hall of Famer would hire an analyst to put together a documentary on how different outlets treated that magnate. I am the least racist person you've ever met. Breitbart has one note, high priority, major supporter of Mr. Trump. In an interview, Bannon would say, What we need to do is bitch slap the Republican Party and get those guys, you know, heaving too. And, and, and if we have to, we'll take it over. And the Republican Party felt the same way about Bannon. In 2013, instead of attending CPAC, a major conference for mainstream conservatives, Bannon hosted an event nearby for the uninvited. I'm embarrassed by your awesomeness. The event featured speakers banned from the main event, like Pamela Geller, who major human rights organizations have denounced for her Islamophobic comments. Islamophobic and we hate them and it's so ugly and we hate you, but we know you're gonna sue us so we'll let you run the ad. Bannon would do an interview in 2014 where he outlined what he thinks is a coming war between Christianity and Islam. All you have to do is read the news every day, see what's coming up on Twitter, see what they're putting on Facebook, see what on CNN, see what's on BBC, see what's happening, and you will see that we're in a war of, I think, of immense proportion. He gave heavy praise to far-right European parties like Brexit's UKIP and France's National Front. He was clearly interested in the use of nationalism, xenophobia, and populism to gain power. They don't like me either, so it doesn't really matter, does it? 
At some point, he flirted with the idea of working with Ted Cruz or Ben Carson to help them win the presidency. But Bannon would meet Trump for a second time through Rebecca Mercer, the billionaire backer of Breitbart News and former backer of Ted Cruz, who'd switched allegiances to New York real estate developer and Teen Choice Award nominee Donald Trump. Huge! Fun fact, Rebecca and her father Robert are huge Republican fundraisers who also own a large stockpile of human urine being used for research to help extend human lifespan. At one point, Trump advisors were trying to tame Trump's fiery rhetoric for Mercer. That would not stand. It was time to populate Trump's team with voices as hateful and apocalyptic as his. The Mercers suggested Bannon. Just days later, Bannon and Trump were golfing together at one of the Pizza Hut spokesman's many golf courses. What will people think? Let them talk. A few days after that, Bannon was running Trump's campaign. Other campaign leaders were pushed out. Paul Manafort, an expert political analyst for dictators, and Corey Lewandowski, an expert in assaulting female journalists, didn't make it to the election. But Bannon did. He resigned as CEO of Breitbart to focus on the Trump campaign. He referred to Trump as an imperfect vessel for his own revolution. But he must have been doing something right. If you think they're going to give you your country back without a fight, you are sadly mistaken. Donald Trump won the election to be the 45th president of the United States. Bannon would catapult his job of running the campaign into a high-powered office in Trump's administration. Chief strategist, a role that requires no Senate confirmation and has the ear of the president. 169 congressmen signed a letter asking President Trump not to appoint Bannon. It is one of the most powerful roles in the world. And Bannon made it even more powerful. The president put out an executive order putting Bannon on the National Security Council, a hugely powerful arm of the government. The same order bumped the director of national intelligence and joint chiefs of staff from the council. But the president never wrote that order. He never even read it. It was written by Steve Bannon. It required no approval by the legislative branch or the judicial branch. No other member of the cabinet had to be involved. All Bannon needed was Trump's signature to give himself an immense amount of power. And he got it. Mm -hmm.